So after I posted this video of my monitor stand a few months ago, I got a bunch of questions about how I model this type of a drawer front. So today I'm bringing you guys another Shaper 3D lesson. Before we jump into it though, I just want to quickly say that we're not being paid by Shaper 3D for this video, but after the recent pricing structure change, we did work out a deal for my audience to continue getting the 10% discount by using a new code in the description, which will make this program a lot more affordable than before. And if you decide to upgrade from the free version, version, be sure to use that code and I'll even get a little bit of a kickback as well, which of course will help me make more of these tutorials. So anyway, I decided to break this video into four different sections because I realized things can get a little bit confusing without first doing a simpler design as sort of a warm-up exercise to get us thinking about how to approach this type of modeling. Then we'll go into the shop and I'll go through my whole design process for the drawer front that's going on my new desk. And I'll show you how to export that model into a CAM software to define the cutting operations for the CNC. And of course, I'll show you all of my cutting settings as well. Then finally, we'll cut the actual part and fingers crossed, hopefully we get something cool out of it. I've got timestamps in the descriptions if you feel like jumping around. All right, let's get started. The first thing that we're gonna do for this section is actually get a picture of a design that we wanna model, which I can either sketch out on my own or find something on the internet. But just to speed things up, I already found something that's being sold on Amazon and I felt was perfect for this exercise. I'll drop a link in the descriptions if you wanna use the same image. Otherwise, if you decide to find something on your own, just make sure that it's simple enough for this part of the exercise. And we'll do something more advanced later on. And once you found this picture, let's take a screenshot of it and then crop out whatever we don't need. Click done and save the photos. Now we can go ahead and launch Shaper 3D. So start designing new design and whenever I start a new design I always like to lock my grid size at one millimeter this is just personal preference you don't really have to do it um, and whenever I'm designing something that is going to be cut on the CNC I like to work on the top surface so let's go to the navigation cube and tap on top now we can go ahead and import the image that we just saved so click on photos and then import that picture we can drag the arrows to move the image wherever we want. So I'm just gonna move it so the bottom left corner is at the origin. It doesn't have to be exact, just uh, you know, somewhere close by is fine. Click done. So now while we're in this view, click on sketch, select rectangle and draw a rectangle about the same size as our image and then close out of that. Tap on the surface and let's extrude that up to five millimeters. All right, so our image is now kind of buried underneath this body. What we can do is go over to the design tree, select image, and then drag that up five millimeters. So that's back on top. While we're here, let's tap right here and change the opacity down to about 60%. That looks good. Uh, close that. All right, now we're all set up to start creating the pattern. Let's start by double tapping this top plane to bring us to the sketch menu. And we're gonna use the spline function for this. If you haven't used the spline function before, the way it works is all you have to do is draw a line, press down to create a control point, draw another line, press down to create another control point, and so on. And then you can control the curvature by dragging the control points around like that. And you may have noticed there's a couple of different spline types. There's control and there's fit. I'm not gonna dive into the differences between these two, but feel free to try both and decide which one you like more. I personally like the control option, so that's what I'm gonna use for the rest of this video. Now let's undo all of that. So what we're gonna do is instead of drawing the splines that follow the peak, we're actually gonna draw splines that follow the valley just like this. And this is exactly why I wanted to do a simple design first to help get us used to visualizing it this way. Because if I had started with a more complex design, it'll be hard to visualize where I need to place the splines and probably hard for you guys to follow along. Anyways, let's continue drawing these splines. So one thing we want to be careful about when drawing these splines is we don't want any of these control points to snap to the edge of the body because once you snap one of these points on the edge, then you're only allowed to move that point along that edge, which will actually make smoothing things out a lot harder later on. But if that does happen like this point up here, all we have to do is select it and then click this paperclip looking thing 
and then now we can move this point around again. So don't worry, you don't have to start over just because you snapped the point to one of the edges. Um, all we want to do is make sure we're placing the splines where they need to be and we kind of have the rough curvature laid out. Once we have all the splines in place, we have to smooth them out. And you can see I used a lot of control points initially, which is fine to get the rough shape. But the less control points you have, the smoother these curves will become. So let's start deleting some of these control points and keeping only what we need to still maintain the proper curvature for each spline. And then what we're going to do is drag the control points around and just keep deleting whatever we don't need. So I want to mention that one of the leading causes for modeling failure where 3D shape is just not being generated is because these curves are not smooth. So it's really important to try to take your time and get these as smooth as possible. Okay, and once everything looks pretty good, it's time to make some magic happen. Let's close out this sketch and rotate the model out of the top view and grab one of these surfaces. Let's extrude it up. Uh, maybe just one millimeter is enough for something small like this. And then we can grab this rotation arrow here and keep dragging until both sides of the extrusion come together to close off in a peak like that. And that's it. We'll just keep doing it for the rest of the model. And I mean, it really is just that straightforward and simple. Um, the only time that it'll fail, as I've said earlier, is when there's something wrong in the spline especially when something's just not smooth in the spline so the surfaces can't come together correctly. So if you can't get these to extrude properly, just go back to your spline and see if there's anything that you can try and smooth out. Usually that'll fix the problem. And that's the last one. So after we're done with that, you kind of notice how these surfaces on the ends are angled like that. So we can fix that by select all of these surfaces that's on the same side and then pick the edge that's on the bottom that's the edge that we're going to rotate these surfaces about and then let's grab this rotation arrow again and just keep increasing that until you know the edge looks about flush to the base so probably like 70 degrees okay and then let's do the same to the other side i mean this this isn't really necessary if your design model is actually larger than what your final model is gonna be. So you can actually just trim everything off. But I mean, for this, I just wanna show you what you can do to correct it in case this is the size that you want. So, okay, that's it. Now deselect and let's go to the design tree here and let's hide everything, the image and the two sketch planes. You'll notice that our pattern bodies are now all combined with the base body that we initially made. So everything's just one piece now. So all that's really left for us to do is smooth out the valleys. Now to do that, all we have to do is click on one of these edges and then pull to create a fillet. I like to increase these as large as they'll go um, just to keep something really nice and smooth. But I mean, that's just personal preference. If you like something that's much sharper, you can keep smaller radius if you want. You know, keep in mind that this all really depends on the size of your CNC bit as well. So, I mean, if the smallest CNC bit that you have is an eighth of an inch, um, an eighth of an inch radius ball nose bit, then you obviously can't go to a one millimeter radius valley. So, I mean, just keep that in mind. Other than that, yeah, this is, uh, pretty straightforward now and it's all smooth sailing from here and we are done so now we can drag the model over to the side and just compare it to our image and see how we did and uh, yeah I, I know it's kind of hard to see with all these lines that's on the model but what we can actually do is go to export and then select image and now down on the bottom if you select this cube it'll turn on and off these lines so if we turn the lines off, we can rotate it around and oh, we can even hide the grids. There we go. That looks even better. This thing's looking pretty darn close to the original image. It's looking pretty good. There's some obvious differences, but it's probably just due to how we constructed the splines. 
And honestly, that's why I like making these things because no two designs will ever be exactly the same, even if you try to copy an image like what we did. Oh, and before I forget, this app has augmented reality feature. And to be honest, I don't actually use this for everything, but for designs that are more decorative than functional like this thing, I always check in AR before carving on the CNC because these things take a while to carve and material is expensive. Let's say that we really like this design and we want to hang this on the wall. The first thing we need to do is rotate the model so that it is oriented the way that it would be in real life, which is vertical. So let's rotate that 90 degrees and then let's move it to the origin as well, like that. There we go. Now all we have to do is go to export, select augmented reality and preview 3D model. And then pick up the iPad and see your wall panel snap to the wall. And we can also move it around and check it from different angles and see what it would look like in real life. So yeah, I think you can see how useful this thing could be for something like a wall decoration or a drawer front. Dun, dun, dun. And you can also export this thing into Apple's Reality Composer app and do even more stuff with it. But that's a whole different video. And before we go off topic, let's take what we learned and head over to the shop. And while we're walking, let me talk to you about the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes for cool people who like to learn. And if you're watching this video, then that means you. Skillshare's unique classes will help you grow your knowledge in woodworking, CAD design, furniture design, video editing, photography, productivity, and more. So as a full-time engineer, woodworker, and YouTuber, being productive in everything has always been my biggest challenge. But Thomas Frank's productivity for creatives class has helped me build a system both in my mind and in the real world to allow me to do more with my time. And at less than just $10 a month for their annual subscription, you'll get their entire collection of classes ad-free. And the first 1,000 of my subscribers who sign up with the link in the descriptions will get a free trial to the premium membership. So what are you waiting for? Now let's get back to my class. All right, so we're in the shop now and I apologize for the awful acoustics in here, but I did what I could, I just don't know how it's gonna turn out. Anyway, so this is the desk I've been working on and I'm thinking about making a drawer front that basically follows the uh, kind of pattern that the wood has on this desktop. And the way I'm gonna do that is sketch something out in Procreate first, but first let's import a picture of the desktop so you guys know what that looks like. And then let's create a new layer and start sketching. So don't even think about the dimensions at this point. This is all just for reference. Okay, now let's draw the lines that kind of follow the edge of the wood that you see in this picture here. So we've got the main pattern. And then we have this giant void right here which we can draw like this, but I'm not really liking the way how everything is going in that same direction. So instead, what I'm gonna do is maybe change this one like this, and then let's make this top line go up, and let's add one more line here to take up this empty space. Okay, now let's take a screenshot of this and then crop out whatever we don't need. Let's click done, save the photos. Okay, now we're ready to go ahead and launch into Shaper 3D. And as before, the first thing I'm gonna do is lock my grid size at one millimeter and then start sketching on the top surface. Let's draw a random rectangle starting at the origin. The dimensions of this is basically just going to be whatever the dimension of the drawer front is. So let's take a measurement. And this is exactly why I love Shaper 3D and being able to model on my iPad. I can make measurements and start designing immediately instead of having to run back and forth between the office and the shop. Okay, anyway, so the dimension came out to be 400 by 90. And then let's extrude that to 15 millimeters. Okay, once we got that, let's select both of these and make a folder and call this folder the drawer base. 
So what we're gonna do different from the last example is that we'll create the pattern separate from the drawer base. That way it'll give us a lot more freedom to maneuver the bodies later on if we decide something else looks better. But now let's uh, create another folder that's called pattern. And in here we'll create a construction plane on top of the drawer base. So to do that, let's click on add and then select construction plane and then pick the top surface of that drawer front. Okay, now we can go ahead and import that picture we made previously. And then just use the tools to move it into position and size it roughly to about, you know, the same as what the drawer front currently is. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect. Let's move it up 15 millimeters so that it's on the drawer face. Okay, let's also set the opacity to 30%. Okay, now keep in mind that the red lines here represent the peaks. So it's gonna be a little harder to visualize them with an actual image of the 3D panel that we saw earlier. But, you know, like anything, just keep practicing, you'll be able to get it. Okay, but once you're ready, let's start sketching by double tapping on this construction plane. Let's start with the lines that kind of spans across the entire drawer front, since that'll just be like what we did previously. All we care about is just get the rough shape of the lines right now, so don't worry too much about how it looks. No, even go as far as just pretending those shorter lines don't even exist. All we care about is the main lines that spans across the entire front face. Okay, once we have that, let's go ahead and draw the valleys for the shorter peaks. And to do that, we just need to draw the splines that take the shape of the negative space. And what I mean by that is, if you look at this one right here, all we have to do is draw the two splines that will form the shape of this empty space. And then for this other one here, we'll do the exact same thing. Okay, now that we have the rough shape of the lines, let's smooth them out by moving the control points. And as I said earlier, the less points you have, the smoother the curves will actually be. And let's just keep going with all the curves until we get something we like. And then the last thing we want to do is close off the sketch between the lines that will form the peaks. So what I mean by that is, if you take a look at here, we have a peak, right? So we want to connect these two lines. And then down here, we have another peak, so we want to connect these two lines. But then there's no peak here, so we want to leave that disconnected. So just follow that logic for the rest of the image. Okay, now just close out the sketch and then hide the drawer base and the construction plane. Now you can see our sketch is blue, which indicates that they're closed sketches. Now let's pick one of the blue surfaces and extrude that up by five millimeters and then keep increasing the angle until the peak closes. And once we have these three bodies ready, let's hide the imported image and then bring back the base body. And then let's just increase the size of that base body to cover the three bodies on top. And this isn't necessary, but I like to do it this way just to have the freedom to make adjustments with where to trim the bodies later. Anyways, let's uh, go ahead and combine all four of these bodies now. By going under tools, select union, and then pick all four of them. Make sure that the keep original is turned on. This way the original bodies will be kept in case we need to change anything. Now let's move this guy out of the folder and call it combined body. Okay, and now we can start adding fillets by, you know the drill, just select the edge and then start pulling away. And then for this bell bottom area, fill it the zipper first and then fill it the legs and the crotch. This will actually create a smoother blend between the fillets. And then let's keep on going with the rest of the fillets. 
Okay, so now we have our final shape, but it's obviously larger than what the drawer front will actually look. So now let's create a cookie cutter trim surface so that we can preview what the final thing will actually look like. To do that, let's create a folder called trim and then add a construction plane. Let's pick the bottom of the drawer front and then offset that until it is above the part body. Now double tap on that plane and draw a rectangle that's 400 by 90. And then select the offset edge function from the menu. Now pick the rectangle and offset the new shape until it's completely outside of the design. And okay, let's close out of the sketch. And once you extrude it all the way down, it's going to cut your drawer front to its final size. Okay, I think that looks pretty good. Now let's go back to the computer and program it for the CNC. Let's go. All right, before we jump over to the computer, let's export this model first. So go to export and then format. Now you can choose either IGIS, STEP, or STL formats. I'm currently running the pro version, so I have all of those options available to me. But if you're running the free version, I think you're limited to only the STL format, which only defines the surface geometry of a 3D object using triangulated surfaces. And so it's mostly used only for 3D printing, whereas IGIS and STEP files both represent 3D objects in CAD programs, and they're the universal standard of 3D modeling. So if you're gonna export an STL, you will have to go through additional steps to convert it into a solid body for CNC work. I went through this whole process when I made the Game of Thrones map. There are other sources available on the internet as well for that. So I'm not gonna cover that in this tutorial. Now for this exercise, I'm gonna export the model as a step file. And for those of you currently running the free version, I will upload my step file to my website so you can download it there and continue to follow along. The link will be provided in the descriptions below. Okay, back on the iPad. Now let's pick step and give it a file name. Let's just call it drawer front. Now click continue. And here you have the option to save the file on the cloud storage, email it to yourself, or if you have a Mac, you can just airdrop it to your computer, which is what I will do. Now just click that and we're ready to hop over to the computer. All right, let's launch your cam software of choice. I'm gonna use Fusion 360 because that's what I'm used to, but if you use the step file or IGIS, any cam software should be able to read it just fine. Okay, so once the program has launched, let's go up here to insert and then select insert mesh and open up the file that we just saved. Okay, so for some reason, I don't know if this is a bug or not, but whenever I insert a mesh, the OK button is always grayed out. What I found works is just click the eyeball next to origin and then the OK button is selectable. So let's select OK. And you'll notice that this model pretty much look exactly like what it did in Shaper 3D. And we can even make changes to this model if we want, which you can't do with STL files. Anyways, let's move on to the CAM process by switching from our current design workspace to the manufacturing workspace. By coming up here, select Manufacture. And the first thing we're going to do is select Setup and then New Setup. And this is where we can define our stock and the orientation of the model. Under machine, we're going to select generic three axis. Since we're going to be cutting this out using a three axis CNC, click select. Under operation type, make sure it's selected as milling. And this next section is where we define the orientation of the model. And since we model this part on the XY plane in Shaper 3D, we can set the orientation as model orientation. And then the stock point is the origin of the cutter head. I normally choose the top surface of the lower bottom left corner right here. So once you select that, then let's move to the next tab to define the stock size. Now for this, I like to be pretty generous and leave 20 millimeter offset uh, for the sides for holding the part down with clamps and also the extra material will come in handy when I have to recalibrate the z-axis. So before clicking OK, I like to make a note of the dimensions right here. This is the size of the stock I'll need to finally mill uh, whatever I need. So let's click OK now. So the first operation that we're going to be doing will be a 3D adaptive clearing, which will efficiently clear out the bulk of the material. So let's go under 3D and then select adaptive clearing. 
And the first thing we need to do is select the tool for the operation. So let's click select. And you can see that I've already got a library full of tools to choose from, but you can fill in this information manually based on the information found on your manufacturer's website, or some will even have all the information in a file ready for you to download straight into Fusion 360's tool library. But for this particular operation, I'm gonna use a quarter inch flat end mill, which I have in my favorites. It's the Amana quarter inch spectral coded spiral bit with the part number 46202-K and let's select. Under this first tab you see this list of speed and feed rates which I'll leave all the important values in the descriptions below for you guys to reference instead of us going through each one. Over in the next tab under geometry let's select uh, bounding box for the machine boundary and then under tool containment we'll select tool inside boundary. This way we keep the tool inside the boundary of the model so that it doesn't cut away the extra 20 millimeter material that we added to the stock earlier. Now uh, for stock contour, uh, we're gonna select the edge of the model. That, that's basically telling this machine to keep the bit inside this perimeter that we just selected. And then make sure that rest machining is checked this is a function used to cut material left behind from the previous operation. Since this is our first operation, under source, we're going to keep from setup stock. And I think the only thing left here is make sure under the passes tab, we set the step down value. So for this, I'm going to set it at six millimeters, which is roughly the diameter of the quarter inch bit. And then lastly, make sure the stock to leave options check so that there's some extra material left for later operations. Now click OK and wait for the toolpath to generate. Okay, so once that's done, we can right click on the toolpath and then come down here to machining time and check how long this operation will take. And it says 12 minutes and four seconds. Not bad. All right, let's move on to the finishing pass. Now for this part, I'm gonna choose the 3D parallel pass. So let's go under 3D again and then select parallel. Once again, select tool and under my favorites, I'm gonna use the Amana 1 8 inch diameter ball nose bit with part number 46225-K. Select. Once again, I'm gonna leave the speed and feed rates in the descriptions below for you guys to reference. Now under geometry, Machine boundary, select bounding box again, tool containment, tool inside boundary, make sure rest machining is selected. And since this is the second operation under source, we want to make sure that it's from previous operations. And since the previous operation left stair step shapes in the model because it's a roughing operation, make sure that under adjustments, we select use as computed or else it's not going to clean up those stair step uh, those stair step shapes. <laughs> it's really hard to say. Okay, now let's go to the next tab, passes. So since this is our finishing pass, a good value to set for the step over is five to 9% of the diameter of the bit. So you'll end up with a really nice smooth surface that won't require much sanding at all. But of course, the finer the step over, the longer it's gonna take to machine the part. So you gotta find that balance. Let's start with 9%, which I believe the step over would be 0.27 millimeters. And since this is our final pass, we're gonna leave the stock to leave unchecked. And let's click OK. Okay, now let's right click on this operation and come down to machine time. Okay, it's gonna take an hour and 41 minutes. So yeah, <laughs> I think I'm gonna leave it at 9%. And well, that's pretty much it. So now we can go ahead and export the cutting directions or AKA G code by right clicking the operation and then come down here to post process. And since I'm using ESO to control my CNC, that's the post processor I will use. Now click okay. Let's find a place to save this. And let's give it a name so that we don't get it confused with the other operation later on. Let's call it adaptive, save. And we're gonna do the same thing to parallel. So post process, click okay. Since my CNC doesn't 
automatically do tool changes. I have to do this individually for each operation. All right, so once these are saved, let's go ahead and launch ESO. Let's go to new project. Under file, we can import the G code. Let's do the first one, adaptive. And then let's create a new work piece under the same project. Let's import G code and then select parallel. And that's it. Now all you have to do is hook the computer up to the CNC, click on carve and watch the machine work. But before moving on to some cool CNC footage and beauty shots of the drawer front, I want to thank you for sticking around till the end. This was a really long video and I put a lot of thoughts into this to hopefully give as much value to you guys as possible. If you want to upgrade to the pro version of the app, please do use the code in the descriptions. You get 10% off and I get some kind of a kickback as well. So if you want to support my gummy bear addiction, then that's the best way to do it. If you enjoyed this video, let me know in the comments and thank you guys so much for watching this and see you guys in the next video.